and I was actually living on the streets for three years. You were living on the beach? My partner ended up getting pregnant to another guy, and the two years that we've been chatting, uh, I could say 90% of it was lies. Surprise. She had children. That she hadn't shared? Yeah. I had nowhere to go. I had no money. When you came here, what was the situation with your finances? I had the lizard. I had 120 wow. of these things all over my body. Today, you've got this beautiful family and you mm. run this business. So I ended up with this baby. The one was... that you knew wasn't your. And then one day, the police turned up, four police with guns. You got arrested and mm. thrown in prison. Yeah. And packed. People sleeping over the top of each other. So no one knew you were in jail. So she wanted you incarcerated and yep. she wanted money. Yeah. And that was the, the judge was going to make that call. I could get on a plane and disappear. At age 67, you're on a delivery bicycle. No motor, no electricity, and you're pedaling 30 kilometers a day. You know, between the kids and the business, you might be the hardest working expat in the Philippines. <laughs> Okay, we're here with Tony, an expat in Cagayan de Oro with quite a story to tell. Uh -huh. Welcome. Thank you, Rob. So, you. where are we here today? We're in Opal. Yeah, at the uh, restaurant Panagatan. Panagatan. And mm. uh, how old are you? I'm 68. And Rochelle is how old? 31. And you've known each other five years? Yeah. How old are your kids? Oh, I've got three children, eight months old, two years old, and five. And, all right, we're going to hear quite a story today. Uh, give us some of your backstory, where you're from, where you grew up, your schooling, and your work history, where you lived, and how you ended up working your way here to be an expat in uh, the Philippines and Cagayan de Oro, Mindanao. Well, I was originally born in New Zealand and I became an engineer. I, um, at the age of 24, I moved to Australia as an engineer for a company as a consultant. And after about five years, Around 1985, I was moved to the USA, to California, as a consulting engineer. And I had many, many years in California uh, before making the, the bold decision to come to the Philippines, which is in about 2010. So, do you remember that when that thought crossed your mind, I'm going to move to the Philippines? What was that moment in your life when well, you thought, I'm, I'm going to just move to the Philippines? Yeah, well, it was really. I'd, I had decided to retire and had a good business. And I was looking for something else to do, so I came, decided to come here on holiday. Just a holiday at yeah. first. Yeah, and um, I got the typical three-month visa, and I arrived in the Philippines, and uh, 12 years later, I'm still here on holiday. I've stayed here the whole time. The whole time? You've yeah. not been back? No. Wow, that's remarkable. So, did you have a family back home? Uh, a long time ago, yeah. Yep. Many, many, many years ago. I'm divorced, and I have a family, but they're all grown, and I haven't seen them in many years. Okay. Uh, How long did you live in California? About 25 years in Wow, China. so you're almost like an American. Yeah, yeah. more American than anything else. More American than anything yeah. else. I was single in America. Okay. And um, then I, I got to the stage where I was burned out at 50 and decided I need a holiday. Right. And I had been chatting to a, a young woman here in the Philippines right. and decided, well, let's meet her and see what it see what transpires. And Never all that there. time, how many years ago is that? Oh, 12 years ago. 12 years. You settled in Kigai and Dior? No, well actually in Dumaguete. Oh, in Dumaguete? Yeah, I went directly to Dumaguete in 2011. Yeah. And I stayed there for five years. And my relationship with that woman, we, we got married. Oh, you got married? Yeah. And how was Dumaguete as a place to live? You Fantastic. spent five years. You liked it's it? It's a beautiful place. Yeah, a lot of foreigners there, but it's very relaxed. It's very clean. It's a beautiful city. I left there reluctantly, really. I, I moved to Cebu, and that's where I met my, my current partner in Cebu um, about five, six years ago. It's very interesting. Dumaguete was my first experience, and uh, because it's uh, a very well, there are a lot of foreigners there. Yes. You, you can get to very easily involved with foreigners, not involved in the culture of the city. So where I lived in, in Cebu Land was further out, and it was all Filipino. Okay. So my life became Filipino. Yeah. And and that was very very nice. I, I really enjoyed the people. are so kind and, and, and sweet natured. And at that time, although I was married, I had separated from my my partner. And I was actually living on the streets for three years, so, living so on the beach. In Dumaguete? Yeah, in Dumaguete. So, so you got married in Dumaguete yeah. to your first Filipino partner, yeah. the one that you met online and drew you out here. Yeah. And you were living on the beach, Yeah. like a well, local. 
Yeah, I was. I so was, so I was take about. me back. Take me back. Take me back. So you uh, you got married. How was the first few years of the marriage? Well, it wasn't. It was only lasted about six months because my partner ended up getting pregnant to another guy. So and, within um, within six months. Yeah. So let's just back up. You met the Filipina online. You chatted with her for two years. Mm. So you, you flew up. Yeah, yeah. You guys hit it off yeah. at first pretty good. Oh yeah, she was a lovely person with great smiles and a, and yeah. a typical really nice Filipino yeah. lady. But um, plagued with um, stories and plagued with lies. And the two years that we've been chatting, I could say 90% of it was lies. Okay. And so when I finally did meet her, and it took months to unravel who she was, yeah. um, there were things came out of so, the woodwork that you know, it just what, no what, idea of. Yeah, what's the, the biggest thing that you can share that you remember that was the biggest surprise? She had children. That she hadn't shared? Yeah. Her, her whole life was, was a fairy tale. She was looking for a fairy tale. Yeah. And so, a lot of Filipino women are, I mean, but, they're yeah. struggling to get out of their way of life. Right, sure. So, well, you know, there's a big economic mm, advantage, and I'm sure they're motivated true. by that. And and many foreign men are very naive to the way of life here. Yeah. They're very naive to the way people think and the way people work. I'm not saying it's negative, but it's a totally different culture. Yeah. So the first six months, you mm -hmm. kind of started unraveling. Uh, the backstory wasn't quite true. Yeah. And then, uh, what's the next major event in that relationship? Well, I made a decision after I found she was pregnant, and I checked with different gynecologists as to the timing and everything else, and they all agreed it wasn't me. Um, I decided to leave the house right. that we were renting, and I had nowhere to go. And I had no money. So she thought she said it was your baby. Yeah. And that's going to become important later on in your story. It becomes very important. Yeah. So I ended up on the street and on the beach and the locals looked after me for so, three years. So what was this, my so when you came here, what was the situation with your finances? What was your plan? How were you planning well, to support yourself? Well, I had a business yourself? in California that I'd intended to sell. Okay. And I, I bought some money here yeah. to look after myself for a period of time. Right. And I'd moved more money into the country once I was here. Yeah. Um, but the story of, of having a wife and being able to trust the finances and everything is something you just don't do in the Philippines. Yeah. And of course a lot of the money went places that wasn't meant to go. Yeah. So, so the, the business never got sold? And no, the crash in America, the big financial crash, yeah, the, yeah. the bubble, it stopped the sale of the business and my business partner couldn't afford to pay his share out. Okay. So it just sat in the balance for five years. So you, even though you had nowhere to go and your resources had run out, you yeah. decided to move out of the house with the yeah. woman. Yeah, and you lived on the, the lived beach. on the beach. And tell yeah. me about that. What was it like being an expat, living on the beach, <coughs> needing, needing help? Well, the funny thing is I never asked for help. Filipino people came to me. In fact, there was one time I was sitting on the beach and I was really down because I had uh, boils, you know, the boils. From the sun, here, yeah. Here they call it a matantaki, eye of the lizard. Yeah. I had uh, 120 wow. of these things all over my body, so I was in a pretty bad way. And I'm sitting on the beach one morning uh, in a bad way and this young boy came along, he was about 10, and he said, are you okay? And I said, yeah, I'm okay. And then he turned around and took off and he came back with a huge plate of food yeah. of all sorts of types of food and he said, here's, here's some food for you, sir, which blew my, <laughs> yeah. blew my mind. Yeah. And that was Dumaguete. It was like that all the time. The people were just superb, amazing. So, Tony, you know, you today you've got this beautiful family and you run this business and I know you get up at 4 a.m. and yeah. you're working six days a week. For you to find yourself in that situation, was there any uh, addiction issues, any any substance issues that, that were involved? No, or, no, no, it was no. just a, you were depressed or what? No, what do you I think? don't. I don't get depressed. Get depressed. I'm a happy person, and I seem to find a way through everything. Yeah. And I think that's what the locals saw in me was that I was very resilient yeah. and, and strong. And I do work for Filipinos and help people, and and it just seemed to be a nice way of life for three years, and it went very quickly. So it was stress-free way of life. Very stress-free. Is that why you stayed at it for three years? You didn't probably. And how did you work your no, way? No, I was sick. I had these boils, yeah. and I had to get rid of them. I actually ran into a New Zealand guy who was—he um, was 88 years old. And he owned an old house on the beach, and he came to me one day and he said, "Tony, I'm going back to New Zealand. I'm, I'm very old now, and I have a house back there, and I've just got married." 
a Filipino woman who was at eighty eight. Yeah, and oh she was fifty six. And he said, I'm taking her back to New Zealand. We won't be back. Yeah. He said, I can't sell my house. You are, you can have it to live in. Wow. So I actually lived in that house for about eighteen months. Yeah. And it's it's quite an a significant part of my life because my wife, who we was now separated, uh, had abandoned her baby, couldn't look after the child she had. So I ended up with this baby. The one was, that you knew wasn't yours. Yeah, but the baby at that time was about six months old and she was not looking after the baby. He was in terrible shape and I ended up going to their family home in the mountain one day and I found this baby in the house. He was just standing holding onto the cot. He was emaciated, he was sick, he was tired, uh, he was in a really bad way. There was nobody there. So I picked the child up and took him to the local hospital. And they said, this child hasn't been fed, hasn't been looked after, what's the situation? So I told them as best what had happened. And they said, well, you better take the child with you. We'll file a police report, you take the child with you, because it's obviously not been looked after. So to cut a long story short, the child stayed with me for about 18 months. And by that time, he was around two years old. Yeah. Beautiful boy. And um, we were happy and never, never saw the, the ex-wife. And then one day the police turned up, four police with guns. They wanted to arrest me because they wanted this baby. And I said, well, what's, what's going on? And they said, well, your wife has told us that you've abused her and you've beaten her up. And we're now going to arrest you, which they did and they threw me in prison. So you got arrested and mm. thrown in prison? Yeah. And how long were you I in I was prison? only in there a few days, but being in a Filipino like, prison is not So a, what exactly is a few days? Three days. Three days. And That's what was a Filipino prison like? Packed. People sleeping over the top of each other. Um, hot as hell and very, very tight, but extremely friendly. The people that were there, from murderers to rapists to you name it. <clears throat> But like these how guys, many? How many? Well, how many in the cell? Hundred. And uh, the uh, food. What kind of food do you get? Just fish and rice. But fish plenty of it. Plenty you can of eat it. All day. Yeah. Yeah. No problem. And with as food. a foreigner, did you feel? <laughs> no um, foreigners there now. Did you feel extremely threatened? Were you? No. Anybody? No. 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 Not at all. The people in there were incredible, and they looked after me like I was a little celebrity, always bringing me food, and everybody was incredibly gracious and really nice to me. So they scooped you up, they took the baby, they put you in jail. Mm -hmm. Well, your experience in prison, what do you remember now that it's been so many years? Well, I just remember how, how it wasn't a bad situation. It wasn't a threatening situation. The people were extremely friendly, would sit down and chat and tell me what had happened in their lives. And I told them what had happened in mine and they said, man, you shouldn't be in here. This is the wrong place. Um, and, and these guys, many of them were in there with no um, judge supporting them, no attorney supporting them, just no, nothing at all. They're just huh. thrown in there yeah. and left for years. For years? Mm. Yes. So how about you? Did you expats come to your support? No. Did you, Nobody, had, you got a public defender? Nobody knew I was there. Yeah. Because I'd just been picked up and, and put in prison. Did you have a group of buddies no. or were you kind of a loner at that I, point? No, I knew a lot of people, but there's no way you, you could get in touch with the people. The, the, the thing that helped were you live, me... Were you living alone or did you have a Filipino absolutely. girlfriend at the time? No, no, you had a baby I, in the house. I just had a baby in me. Just um, you and the baby? Yeah, and, we, and all the locals knew, knew us. But these, Tony you know, and the, the, child the Filipinas, and, they see you with a baby, they want to move in and take care of it, oh, don't they? No, well, I didn't allow that. We, we were happy by ourselves. But yeah. they, they looked after us, they gave us food. And they were all, always friendly. Yeah, so us. no one knew you were in jail. No, that the, the police who put me there, I knew them very well because we'd have the occasional pair. After a couple of days, an attorney turned up, a young guy, a very, very nice attorney. He's only 30 years old, and he said, hey, you're not, you can't stay here. And he bailed me out. Yeah. So I got out, and he paid the bail, he paid everything, and really? he said, I'm going to help you. Yeah. And in fact, the, the court case that went on for three years, he's never charged me one peso. Uh, for the whole thing, he's just a superman. He said I was in a bad situation. Yeah. So you well, get so he gets you out of jail. Then what's the next? Uh... Well, once I got out of jail, of course I was, I was on bail and I had all the fingerprinting and everything else. That was about the time because the child had been taken away. The whole thing favoured 
female. But they, they won't even listen to a foreigner, right. so it's one of the things you need to be very aware of. Yeah. Foreigners need to be aware of here. So what was the case about? Well, I, I was being, a, I had been accused of not supporting the child financially. Okay. She was claiming it was your child. Yeah. Claiming it was her, my child, claiming money, claiming that I hadn't fed the child or her or done anything yeah. for, for two years, and which in fact turned out to be wrong because the child had to be hospitalized several times and I had to bring money into the country, yeah. 30, 40, 50,000 every time. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And so I, I had done these things. But she'd claimed that I'd beaten her up and all sorts of things, so it went on and on and on. So the court case was once every month for about two years, two wow. and a half years. And, and uh, the case was for money, or, for, or what was the judgment she was seeking? She was seeking money, and she was seeking to get me put in prison for, uh, for assaulting her. So she wanted you incarcerated, and yep. she wanted money. Yeah. And that was the, the judge was going to make that call. And the judge was intending to do that. Right from the first day I met the judge, when, when somebody made a comment in the court as a witness for my wife, it was a lie. Yeah. I just said, that's a lie. And, and the judge stood up and said, you're a criminal in this case, and you have no rights as a foreigner. Right. You you need to keep your mouth shut. So now and I said, no, I'm not going to do that, judge. If someone's lying, I'm going to tell you whether you like it or not. And the judge looked at me sideways and didn't like the fact that I questioned her, but she did it right. And so from then on, the judge started to think about the bias, and she heard all the, the full story from my wife. But as a... Um, as a, I was called a criminal, having to testify, I wasn't allowed to give any of my story. Nothing at all. As the defendant, you're yeah. not allowed to give any testimony? No, nope. you're allowed to answer the questions oh. that they put to you yeah. in such a way that it doesn't matter what you say, right. you incriminate yourself. So you could never actually give any proof for anything. So you're living in Dumaguete and going to court once a month? Mm -hmm. and, uh, so you stayed in Dumaguete another two, two and a half years until yeah. the trial was over. Yeah. And uh, were you like, you know, were you really worried at how no. this was going to turn out? No, I wasn't worried because I resigned myself to the fact that I, I was getting old. If something nasty was going to happen, I would just disappear somewhere else. And there's nothing I can really do about it. So I was quite relaxed about so it. So your plan was just to um, just write it out. To, to, you were going to just stage left if yeah. if you. But you would still be free and you'd have enough time. I could get on a plane and disappear. Yeah. But what was happening during the court case, the judge was starting to suspect the lies coming out of this woman all the time. And the big one that did it was, she claimed the child is mine. Yeah. And then, so I said to the judge, okay, can I go for custody of, of the child? And then she signed an affidavit to the court that the child wasn't mine. Okay. So this came up before the judge and the judge says, you're claiming this, you're claiming that. Yeah. This is perjury. Yeah. I can put you in jail for three years for perjury. Right. And so the judge then decided there was a lot of lies and decided to to knock the case on the head. Yeah. The finality of it was that the judge had buried the case and it disappeared for seven years. And then suddenly the I'm judge disappeared? No, the case? The, the case disappeared. So so the case somehow came back. Yeah, it and came you're back. having to deal with it now. Well, it came back here six months ago. They just, out of the blue, I get a, a, a call from the court saying that I have to go on probation or go back to Dumaguete to sit another to, for judgment. So I wrote to the judge, and the judge decided, no, we'll just do a probation. And so I, I got in touch with my attorney and said, well, why can't we file against this? You know? And the judge said, well, if you file against it, they'll put you in jail for five years until the case comes before an appeals court. So you agreed to be on probation? And I said, well, how long is probation? Six months, once a month. So I said, well, let's do the probation. Once get a month? What do you have to do once a month? You don't plant trees for two hours. So really? You put on like it's a, a holiday. You have to put on a, a, a no. suit? No. no. Really? It's a holiday. Just turn up at the beach and at a certain day once a month for a couple it's of like hours. It's like community service. Community service. And it's really fun because there are 400 other guys there and it's just a laugh and you eat a lot of government food. And so you get six months once a month. So how many, much more time do you have? Yeah, I've only got one to go. One to go. So you're technically on probation for something, but there was a seven-year gap where you you thought it was over. Yeah. 
No, well, it was meant to be, because under the statute of limitations, it was meant to be Ghana. I'm not sure of the implications of what actually happened there, but it just got Yeah. So, when the, you, when you thought it was all done in Dumaguete, is that when you left Dumaguete? What, yeah. what, what uh, happened in your life that drove... I, I actually left Dumaguete, I decided one day, I've had enough of here, I'm through the court cases. I walked from Dumaguete to Cebu. Oh my God. I got on, on the boat for free because I had no money. I landed on the in, ferry from Dumaguete to yeah, Cebu. Yeah, it's only 20 minutes and it's only 45 pesos, but I didn't have money. Well, you didn't go to Cebu City, you went to the island of Cebu. Yeah, I got to Cebu, Cebu, Liloan, Cebu, on the ferry. Yeah. Then I walked from Liloan to Cebu, which how, is how three and a half hours on a bus, and it took me two days. So you just walked? I just walked. And I'm, I'd left Liloan, southern Cebu, and I met a French guy in a lovely big house on the water. So I stayed with him for a couple of days and we had a lot of laughs and drank a lot of beer and he gave me some money and he said, you're on your way, he said, you'll be okay. And so I just walked the rest of the way to Cebu. And when you got to Cebu, you went into Cebu City? Yeah. And what did you do there? I ran into some guys who owned a bar and a, a store and they asked me what I was doing. So I told them the story and they said, come and stay with us. So I stayed with them for nearly a year. They gave me a room and they fed me and I did work around the place and they became my best friends and yeah. we had a ball. Just 12 months relaxing and... No significant other, no Filipina during that time? You were... Uh, Just had a, had a nice quiet... Yeah. So at the end of that year, did you start to feel like the same uh, Tony that had first come to the Philippines? No, I was quite changed. <laughs> I was a businessman that was all wound up to somebody who was totally relaxed and putting on some weight and starting to feel good. Yeah. Uh, there was one significant point. There was a bridge from Mandawi that goes over to Mactan Island. And I'm walking over the bridge one day and I've been given an old cell phone. I saw this couple on the bridge, a young guy and a woman. I thought, why can't I be like that? And then I saw this woman on Facebook. And so I said, hi. And she said something like, I'm a nice person, but really ugly. So I wrote a note and said, well, you're a nice person, but you're not ugly. And she said, well, come and see. And that's the lady I'm with now. That's Rochelle. Yeah. And you were walking across the bridge <coughs> and you just saw her on Facebook. How, yeah. Like she was in a group who were a friend of a friend. She was there helping a sister in Brazil. And she was living in Lilo and Cebu City, uh -huh. or two Lilo Ann's. Yeah. So we just met and, and had a cup of coffee and we met four or five times and we got on extremely well. And, and how was Rochelle when you met her? 27. 27 and you were 62? Uh, about that. Yeah. And uh, so you met Rochelle in Cebu City. You'd been working for a year. Um, what, what, how long did you stay in Cebu City? And, we, we were there nearly five years. Oh, so yeah. you've only come to Pigai and Deiro recently? Two years ago. Okay. Yeah, we, we were, we decided to be together and of course we had our first child. Tony, uh, you uh, made a decision to have children at this age. Mm. Tell me about that process. Well, it's very interesting. I'm a grandfather, I know. <laughs> Um, it was something that felt perfectly natural. Uh, I met this woman who, who hadn't had children and she was a, a, an amazing person, just so relaxed and honest. And it just felt right. And so we decided to have a, a child. What's it like to have little children running around the house at age Fantastic. The best decision I ever made. It's just, I've got time now for children and I'm with my kids all the time. And I feel it. I feel their love and their, their interest. Yeah. You know? When my first family, <clears throat> nearly 30 years ago, I never was never with them because I had a business, so I was too busy. Why did you move to Cagayan de Oro? My partner's mother had a, had a brain tumor. Jocelyn's mother, mother lives in Oppo, and okay. she had a brain tumor. Uh, so Jocelyn came down here to see her before she passed away. Yeah. And it was only intended to be a month, but it was dragged on for four or five months. So I decided to come down here. And you had three little children at home. Two little two children at that time, yeah. yeah. So I came down here, and we loved it so much, we decided not to go back. So you were working? What kind of work were you doing back then? Well, day? I wasn't. I wasn't working. I was living off some funds that we brought into the country. Okay. And uh, 
So you moved to Opal, yeah. and uh, uh, Joselle's mother uh, passed, away. passed away. Yeah. But you you uh, made a home here. Yeah. Uh, two years ago. Yeah. And uh, what do you think of Cagayan de Oro as as a home compared to the other places you've been? Well, we never went into Cagayan de Oro. We stayed in Opal, which is a, a very small city. And so I was always thinking maybe we'll go somewhere else. But we've met so many good people here, and we've now met the, the expats group. Right. And we travel a lot with Cagayan de Oro. Yeah. And of course, we have our food manufacturing business, which gives us the cash. You told me that you have a trike uh, and you bicycle 30 miles a day. 30 kilometers a day. 30 yeah. kilometers a day. And you know, there's probably some people that are watching this interview that heard the beginning parts of your story and thought you might be somebody who didn't have uh, a good work ethic. Ah. Uh, but now uh, we're here to say that at age 67, you're on a delivery bicycle, no motor, no electricity, and you're pedaling 30 kilometers a day. Yeah. You get up at 3 o'clock in the morning. You and uh, Giselle yeah. wake up at 3 a.m. Mm -hmm. The kids sleep for a couple hours longer. Yeah. We have a pedal bicycle with a big container on the back. That's right. And you prepare food for how long before you get on the train? About five hours. So until 10 a.m. Yeah. yeah. We, we got to a situation where we needed to make some money. So the first, the first day we started the business, March last year, we made 10 packets of muffins, put them in a basket, and I walked up the street. And within three months, it had got so big, we bought this tricycle. We filled it with empanada and hamburgers and hot dogs and rice food and all right. sorts of meals. Yeah. And now we have two trikes on the road. And oh, so you have an employee that pedals? Or? Yeah, we yeah. do, well, a okay. commission agent, yeah. yeah. And business is booming. It's a really great business. Yeah. And probably the success of it is being a foreigner in this country because Filipinos are so receptive to everybody. They're so friendly and so willing to see what you're doing and yeah. what you've got and talk yeah. to you. Yeah, so most does. people think at 67 you want to be on the golf course and you want to be just visiting your grandchildren. In terms of your happiness, uh, when you look back, when you reflect back on your life. Well, this is hard work. I mean, I've been self-employed all my life. I've never had a job. So I've, I've always been a highly motivated person. Uh, but I'm lucky in that my partner is highly motivated as well. And together, we are really good. I couldn't have done it with that. Priscilla are pretty so, hard working. Yeah. Oh, she's damn hard working. She gets up at the same time as me with three babies. and and works until I hit the road at 8 o'clock yeah. and then when I'm back at 12 she's there making food again and incredibly supportive but it's put us in a place where I don't get a pension yeah. my country won't pay me a pension so we and all those years you worked in America like social security doesn't kick in yeah, I was self-employed so I had my own scheme oh, okay so it's never kicked in but New Zealand they've avoided the so you've got, to, you've got to earn all the cash flow we, that you have. We pay for everything. Yeah, we yeah. look after ourselves and, it, and it's very really good. Yeah. You know, we're happy doing it. Yeah. So you, what about buying, how about an electric track in the future? What do you uh, think? Well, we, we, our business plan is very shortly we'll have a, a three-wheel motorized a big yeah. track. Rather than doing X amount a day, we'll do triple. Okay. And that's coming very yeah. soon. Good. But it's part of the business plan. Yeah. That's we awesome. have to, to learn about Filipino food and the culture and a thing called Otang, which is pay for it later. All this sort of yeah. thing. So we've learned a lot. You know, between the kids and the business, you might be the hardest working expat in the Philippines. <laughs> Probably the craziest one, that's for sure. <laughs> so, Tony, just reflecting back on your life, your history, it's a really wild ride. Uh, what are you most grateful for in your life? What am I most grateful for? I think it's, I've always been able to bounce back. There's never been a roadblock that I can't get past. And my health has, has kept me really good. I'm physically extremely fit. Yeah. Um, I can, I'm, more, I'm fitter than a 20 year old man. Well, yeah. And I'm 68. And, and I, I could run 20 miles now and I wouldn't even get cut. So I think my health has been a huge part of it. So reflecting back on your life, have you ever dreamed of doing something in your life but you haven't? Maybe the question is why not? No regrets. I've had a really, really good life. Yeah. And it was a bit down when I arrived here, but I've not had a great life yet. So what about the other side of the coin? What's your most terrible memory? Being accused of something I hadn't done. So let me talk to you about the Philippines in general. A funny story. 
on the plane coming from coming here from California, I sat next to a guy who was about 45. He was a um, Filipino American, born here, went to the States, immigrated to the States when he was about 20, very well educated. <clears throat> And he asked me what I was doing, so I told him, he said, I'm going to tell you one story. Do not believe anybody. Do not trust anybody. Verify everything. And it was probably the best bit of advice I've ever had. How so? Well, if you're in a situation where you, you decide to find a woman and, um, and you want to trust her, trust by all means, but verify everything. Absolutely everything. When you fall in love, you don't do those things because you think you can override anything. No way, not in this country. It's very, very different. I'm not saying people are liars, I'm not saying people are cheats, but their, their way of life is very different. There's still a very third world mentality, especially amongst uneducated young women. Yeah. And an older man is very naive. Right, well, yeah. Yeah. Has there been anything about adapting to the culture that That's took, been hard. took a little bit more yeah. effort? That's been hard because people here are always late. And their attitude is they don't care, or they, they don't mind everything being late or slow or out of stock. I've found that very hard the first five years, adapting from a, I can have anything every minute I want living in California, coming here to being able to get nothing that I want within a day or two days or three days. So I found that difficult and I had to adapt. What about security and safety? Have you ever had any uh, personal threats here, personal um, safety here in the Philippines and um, were you ever burglarized, were you ever assaulted? Nothing, no. nothing in 12 years. I've never seen any type of animosity or fighting or never seen any theft. I hear of different things but I've never seen it. And as, seen as an expat, do you feel like your residence might be targeted because it would be a target rich environment compared to the traditional Filipino no. family? Never felt. No. no. We've and, never been there. One other question. As an expat of uh, an age gap relationship, Rochelle's uh, 32 now. Yeah. And uh, when you're walking around, when you're in public, do you feel like people are looking or they're making side remarks? Do you ever feel uncomfortable? Never. 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 No. We're, we're good together. I have seen some foreigners with young girls who are obviously 18 year old girls with 80 year old men. Yeah. And everybody looks and comments about that, even foreigners comment about it. Yeah, it's yeah. not a good look. Right. But I've never felt anything, I've never ever had it mentioned to me. Even Jocelyn never feels uncomfortable. Right. It's just not an issue. Yeah. And you mentioned that when you first got to the Philippines, uh, you saw more uh, quote unquote passport bros yeah. just coming for a vacation and a good time. Yeah. And that's changed over the years. Huh? It very much has changed. It had to change because it was very bad. I haven't found that in the last few years. I'm just not at all. But most so the of the foreigners I meet now are genuine, yeah. looking for partners, not on a sexual vacation. I have a special guest to ask you our last interview question. Okay. okay. Hi, Tony. Thank you for, uh, for an interview. So, um, if you will win a lottery that is five million US dollars, what would you change and why? Well, I wouldn't change from here. I would stay here. Probably the only thing I'd do is buy better accommodation. Thanks. Thank you, Rob. I think everybody is going to be fascinated with your oh, story. I was, I thought I knew part of it, but I was fascinated just uh, interviewing you and uh, really appreciate you no sharing with everybody today. Thank you so much. Welcome to the Philippines. It's a lovely place. Do come. Till next time, guys.